when I was very young, no more than seven or eight years old, my father told me about a murder that had been committed when he was a boy. It happened in the town adjoining the one where we lived in Ohio. In those days, a murderer was hanged outside in broad daylight, and everyone was invited to come see the act and all the gruesome details that went with it. It was an eager and anxious crowd, with everyone trying to get in at the moment of death. My father had managed to get to the front where he could watch, but as they adjusted the rope around the man's neck, my father could stand no more. He turned his head away and felt humiliated and ashamed for the rest of his life that he could have played that much of a hand in the killing of a fellow man. My mother and father were not usual people. They were free thinkers in a valley full of rock-ribbed religionists, progressives among conservatives for as far as you could see, the only intellectuals. Would you believe my mother thought women should have the right to vote and even said so right out loud as early as 1840? <laughs> and I'll never forget, though this was, uh, I was only seven or eight at the time, she never protested when my father kept me out till midnight riding with him in a hay wagon. Because underneath the straw were slaves my father was helping escape from south to north, from slavery to freedom, along the Underground Railroad. My father always did just enough work for hire, carpentry, house painting, driving a hearse, to be able to buy books, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, law, science, religion, metaphysics. <laughs> He loved his books. He loved for us to read them. If I became anything at all, it's because of my father's patience and his books. And to be honest about it, just plain hard work on my part. I remember I was nine when my father put me to work on what had to be the hottest summer day I can ever remember, hoeing potatoes. I worked hard for several hours. Then I ran away from that hard work went into the practice of law, <laughs> and have not done any work since. <laughs> Why the law? Well, in my hometown of Kinsman, on every 4th of July, right after Squire Allen read the Declaration of Independence, which we thought he'd written because he always read it, <laughs> he'd introduced some lawyer from the county seat. I remember seeing the man's horse and buggy outside the hotel in the morning and thinking how nice they were and how much, how much money a lawyer must make. He never seemed a bit afraid to stand up before the public. His boots were shiny like they'd just been greased. He talked very loud and moved his hands and arms a great deal. <laughs> the old farmers, they clapped and nodded their heads and said, mighty smart man, great man. That's why the law. I've never been sure I made the right choice. The law is a bum profession is generally practiced, <laughs> devoid of idealism, practically poverty-stricken as to any real ideals. But I didn't realize that until it was too deep to get out. <laughs> I think I was fascinated by the idea of the law, the clash of good minds, the people I meet. Hell, it was better than baseball. <laughs> Although, one afternoon in high school with my girlfriend Jessie watching, I came to bat in the bottom of the ninth. We were one run behind. There were two men on base and two men out. <laughs> just like Casey at the bat, only I hit one over the grocery store and won the game. Nothing would ever be better than that. Not even the monkey trial. <laughs> I didn't have much education. A year of college, a year of law school in Ann Arbor. In those days, a committee of lawyers would examine you for admission to the bar. They were all really good fellows and wanted to help you through, which they did for me. 
They did it for me and as well as I could ever hope to, to have been done for me because my first lawyer case was drawing up a contract for a horse trade. For this, I was paid 50 cents by each side. <laughs> With all that cash jingling in my pockets, I felt so flush and reckless, I asked Jesse to marry me. <laughs> Jesse must have felt so reckless, she decided to take a chance. Prettiest girl you ever saw. Kindest, easiest going, simplest in her tastes. She had a lot of small town in her, and I guess so did I, because we were very happy together. We lived four years in Ashtabula, Ohio. Horses were being bought and sold at such a rate that I was able to put aside enough money to buy a house, $500 down. But at the last minute, the seller refused to sign over the deed. He didn't think we could keep up the installments. I got so damn mad, I told him, well, that's, that's just fine by us. We're planning to move away anyhow. Next day, I ran into a woman on the street who I never cared for. And how's our prominent lawyer today? <laughs> she asked me. Oh, fine, fine. I, uh, I just got a big case. Oh, really? Here in Ashtabula? Uh, no, no, uh, in, uh, in Chicago. Oh, well, isn't that lovely? When are you going to try it? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow. <coughs> I took the early train to Chicago the next morning. I had to. <laughs> that woman had seen me on the street. She had told everybody in town I was a liar, <coughs> which I was. <laughs> so I came to Chicago with straw in my hair and a suit bought and fitted at the Ashtabula Hardware and Emporium. They tell me I've had this look my whole life. Some of the reporters at the Scopes trial were giving me a hard time. I told them, I spend as much money on my clothes as you do on yours. The only difference is, I sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago. I arrived in Chicago at the most shameful moment in the city's history. The people of that city had just demanded and been granted the death by hanging of four men they called anarchists. It all started with the Chicago strike of 1886 when company police shot seven workers outside the McCormick plant. A protest meeting was called in Haymarket Square. The meeting was peaceable. At about 10 o'clock it started to rain. People started to disperse. There were only a couple of hundred still in the square when Captain Bombfield, against the mayor's strict orders not to bring police into Haymarket Square that night, marched into the square in front of 180 uniformed men. We are peaceable, cried the speaker. The, the meeting was over. We are peaceable. At that moment, in the building above the square, some, some lunatic, to this day they don't know who, threw a dynamite bomb. It landed among the policemen. Seven policemen were killed. Sixty more were wounded. And it killed the socialist movement in the eight-hour day as well. Eight men were taken. Eight men not accused of throwing a bomb, but of the unpardonable crime of writing that capitalism was the source of poverty, misery, and crime. And the state of Illinois charged the men with conspiring with a man unknown, or men unknown, in a place unknown, in a manner unknown, to throw the bomb. Evidence was submitted that it had been manufactured by the police. And during the trial, the judge allowed into evidence articles the men had written and told the jury that if they believed these articles had influenced the man who threw the bomb, they were justified in finding the defendants guilty of murder. Four of the eight were hanged. One, Louis Ling, the youngest, killed himself in prison by biting down on a dynamite percussion cap and blowing his head off. Three more were sentenced to long term. 
And the people of Chicago pronounce themselves satisfied. Still, <laughs> Chicago was an extraordinary place. It was life and excitement for me. New ideas, new people, good talk and debates. Good friends like the great John Peter Altgeld, who helped me get a job with the city of Chicago as their special assessments attorney. Uh, I didn't know what it meant either. <laughs> Other than it meant $60 a week. <laughs> I worked four years for the city of Chicago. I went up against the railroads a number of times on right-of-way litigations generally managed to lick them. So one day, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad came to me with a very good job offer as their general attorney. I frankly wasn't sure. My thoughts on life had not equipped me for this sort of work. But Arkell <coughs> thought I should take it, and finally I did. It did allow us to buy a nice house on the north side where I hoped Jesse would be happy. She wasn't really. Big city, new ideas, new friends. She said it wasn't what she bargained for, and of course it wasn't. Did you get outside today, Jess, huh? How was your day? Did you get outside? It was just so beautiful down by the park. I hope you didn't. Well, I just hate to think of you cooped up in here all day with just you and Paul. Why don't you put him in his carriage and take him down to the park? No, no, of course you don't, if you don't want to. It wasn't one-sided, of course, it never is, on my part, among other things. I wasn't home much. I served the railroads during the day, <coughs> settling claims and representing them in court. And at night, I'd go out with John Altgeld and my other good friends, free thinkers mostly, well, we talk books, religion, <coughs> politics, till dawn. I worked two years for the Chicago and Northwestern. Then in 1894, Eugene P. Debs called out his railway union in support of the Pullman strikers and struck every railroad in the country, including the one I worked for. I had to choose sides. George Pullman, the sleeping car man, had built a brand new town on 500 acres of Illinois Prairie to house his workers. It was an extraordinary place. Listen to how he describes it. Bright beds of flowers and green velvety stretches of lawn dotted with parks and pretty water vistas, homes filled with light a town where all that inspires the cleanliness of person and of thought is generously provided. I almost bought a house there myself. <laughs> One thing I couldn't understand, why anyone living in such a paradise, such a garden of Eden, would ever want to go on strike? I mean, was it conceivable? Was it possible that in this pamphlet his own company had put out, Mr. Pullman had inadvertently left out a detail or two. <laughs> I took the train down to see for myself. The main street was a vision. Bright red flower beds, tall green trees, beautiful brick homes and trim lawns. Lovely. Only, and this was curious, one block off the main street where the workers lived, the houses didn't have lawns. They didn't have windows. They had at most one faucet for cold water, and that was in the basement where it was cheapest to run the pipes in. Three, four, five families crowded into the same tenement using the same toilet in the entire town where everything that inspires the cleanliness of person is generously provided. Not one bathtub. I tried talking to some of the people who lived there, but they were afraid to talk. Every move they made was watched. Everything they said reported back to the company. If a man even talked of joining a union, he was fired that same day. His family 
put out of their home and his name put on a blacklist that was sent to every railroad in the country. And the wages. 1894 brought hard times. Skilled workers who had been making $3.20 a day found their wages cut until after Pullman took out their rent money, all they had left to feed their families on was four cents a week. But in the Pullman Company store where the, where the wives had to shop, those prices didn't change. Forty-three men asked to come in and tell Mr. Pullman their families were starving to death. They asked for and were given a solemn promise not to be discharged if they came in to talk. Mr. Pullman listened to the 43 men, then told them there was nothing to discuss, that his only obligation was to his shareholders, and that he could see no reason to give his workers a gift of money. And the next day, he fired them all and put their families out on the street. That's when the Pullman strike started, and Gene Debs called out his railway workers in support. Of course, it didn't take our government any time at all, did it? choose sides. They got one injunction making it a crime for a man to go on strike. Another one, if one man suggested to another man that he even consider going on strike. But I never thought I'd live to see the day when the United States government would call out armed troops against its own unarmed citizens on the streets of Chicago. Just look at them. 3,600 of them Guns drawn, bayonets fixed, lined up against the strikers. Just look at them. Hey, fellas, you know what day this is? This is Independence Day, the 4th of July. First, there were angry names, then fists and rocks. Till at 3.30 in the afternoon, the men tried to break through the troops, trying to disperse them. Seven strikers killed. No one in the army charged. Debs and his entire executive board indicted for conspiracy to commit murder, his own people's murder. And I went into the office of my boss, Mr. Marvin Hewitt, president of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Debs has asked me to defend him against you, Mr. Hewitt. I can see no reason for turning him down other than my own selfish interest. So I'm going to do it. I don't believe in socialism, but I do believe that government ownership of railroads is better for the people than railroads ownership of government. <laughs> Gene Debs. There may have lived in some time, some place, a kindlier, more gentle soul, but I have never known him. In his jail cell the night before his trial started, he told me, Clarence, go get yourself a good night's sleep and don't worry about me. We'll get through this all right. If not this time, next time. Gentlemen of the jury, if a boy should steal a dime, a small fine would cover the offense. He could not be sent to the penitentiary. But if two boys plot to steal a dime, but do not do it, they could both be sent to the penitentiary as conspirators. Not only could they be, but people are constantly being sent under similar <coughs> circumstances. This is an historic case that will count much for liberty or against liberty. Conspiracy from the days of tyranny in England right down to the day the railroad uses it as a club is the favorite weapon of every tyrant. It is an effort to punish the crime of thought. If there are any citizens still interested in protecting human liberty, let them study the conspiracy laws of the United States which have grown until today, no one's liberty is safe. 
There is a conspiracy here, dark and damnable, and I'd like to say boldly to this court that someone is guilty of one of the foulest conspiracies ever to disgrace a free nation. If my clients are innocent, then other men are guilty of entering the temple of justice and using the law which was made to guard and protect and shelter you and me and these defendants for the purpose of hounding innocent men to a prison pen. This is not the first time that evil men, men who are criminals themselves, have conspired to use the law for the purpose of bringing righteous ones to death or to jail. They sentenced Debs to six months in the Woodstock jail. He got off easy. They put him in a cell meant to hold six people. Outside the barred windows was a garden with beautiful flowers. In the cell with him was a simple mountaineer from the south who had done nothing but give nature a chance to convert corn into whiskey. <laughs> <coughs> you couldn't imagine why he was there. Any more than I can imagine why men who think themselves civilized build cells or walls. <laughs> there were three or four others in the cell with him and the atmosphere was that of a happy family. And so it was. For the place was radiant with the sunshine and kindness and love of Eugene B. Debs. This place isn't so bad, he said to me. I look out and see those flowers. There are bars in front, I know that. But I never see the bars. After Debs, I did not consider going back to work for the railroad. Fortunately, labor felt as well disposed towards me as I felt towards labor. And for the next 17 years, I was to represent them in most of their important cases. This uh, informal arrangement lasted happily on both sides, I believe, until 1911, when I was retained to defend the McNamara brothers in the Los Angeles Times bombing case. After that trial, organized labor would have nothing more to do with me. They called me a traitor to their cause, and some men spat in my face as I left the courtroom. But that was not for 17 years. In the 90s, I was practicing law in Chicago mainly on the side of the weak, sometimes on the side of the strong, but never on the side of the weak, or the never on the side of the strong against the weak. I was happy in my work, and I felt useful. Being a lawyer in Chicago, in contact with malefactors of all types, I can tell you that the Illinois legislature was none too good in those days either. <laughs> <laughs> Representatives were never any different. They, they were exactly the same, never any different in any way, shape, or fashion. I came to realize this and offered up my services to them, which they rejected. But I knew that if I didn't work something out with them, it would be a difficult situation for me. In, th in uh, Chicago, we had a bunch of, uh, we had a bunch of massage parlors that were fronts for houses of prostitution. It got so bad that the word massage came to mean well, I think you can guess what it came to mean. <laughs> and to give someone a uh, massaging meant uh, 
Well, I think you can guess what that meant too without my spelling it out. <laughs> Just to interrupt myself for a minute here, I've always felt that most lawyers, myself included, tend to say more than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> I remember one counsel representing a man accused of biting another man's ear off in a fight. There was only one witness, and as counsel stood up to cross-examine, he said, so you're telling me that you didn't actually see my client bite that other fellow's ear off? No, sir said the witness. And of course, counsel could have stopped right there. <laughs> He's bound and determined to ask one more. <laughs> so, if you didn't actually see my client bite the man's ear off, how can you be so all dang fired sure he did bite the man's ear off? Well, sir, I saw him spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> All the massage parlors were closed down, making it impossible for a bunch of hard-working masseuses to earn a living. Their association sent a committee to me asking me to file an injunction against them being closed down. I did, too. Got the ordinance revoked. On the way out of court, the state's attorney nudged me and said, Clarence, you gave the state a good massaging on that one. <laughs> <laughs> when I went out on my own, I didn't have much trouble getting clients. One reason may have been I never charged a man a fee who couldn't afford to pay. A lawyer must do a lot of work for which he can never hope to be compensated, and that's how it should be. He can only hope that every now and again he'll get somebody who can pay. I remember once a young man came into my office, asked me to defend him on a charge of robbery. He told me he didn't have any money, wanted to pay a fee, didn't have any money, but thought he could raise some that evening. <laughs> I told him I thought he better get another lawyer. I did not care to take money that had been stolen so recently. <laughs> I told a lot of men what I thought they ought to do during the course of my lifetime, usually 12 at a crack. <laughs> sometimes they've had the good sense to listen to me, and sometimes they've had the good sense not to. I, for years I've been telling everybody I could catch that they ought to take the best friend I ever had, the wisest, most independent, incorruptible man in the world, John Peter Altgeld, and get him elected governor of Illinois. And damned if they didn't do it, too, in 1892. It was assumed that Altgeld's first order of business would be to pardon the Haymarket anarchists. Three of them were still alive then, still in jail. It's certainly what I, what I thought he'd do. Well, it wasn't his first act, or his second, or even his hundredth. He said that when he could spare the time, he'd look over the case and do what he thought was right, but that he must take his own time. In the next weeks and months, I made the suggestion to him again, not once, but several times. He always eluded me. Finally, I went to him one last time. I told him everybody expected it, and that despite what some were saying, it would not create hostility toward him and that I and others could see no reason for him waiting. I'll never forget how he turned to me quietly and calmly and said, I don't mean to offend you or lose your friendship, but don't deceive yourself. If I conclude to pardon those men, it will not meet with the approval you expect. Let me tell you that from that day, I will be a dead man. He studied the case until he was sure, and then he granted the pardon. All Gale ran for governor, and governor again two years later. He lost as he knew he would. 
He would never win another election, and the reason was always the pardon. The newspapers fought him bitterly, but in the mills, in the mines, in the factories, he was worshipped almost like a god. Though he would never govern the people again, he could still serve them and fight for them, which he did up until the day he died. than the Pennsylvania coal miners. Men who work underground in 12-hour shifts, 365 days a year, no time off for Christmas or Thanksgiving. Men whose 10-year-old daughters work in the mills next to the mines for three cents an hour. The president of the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company tells us, why well, they don't suffer? Why? Well, they can't even speak English. You say you love children, sir. I have no doubt that you do. Just as the wolf loves mutton. <laughs> You're a breaker boy, Johnny McCaffrey. That means they set you and a hundred others down to straddle the chute. And when the coal comes rushing down, you pick out the slate. What does that take, Johnny? Quickness? You've got to be quick to pick out the slate, quick not to lose a finger or a hand or an arm. That ever happened to any of your friends? How many of your friends? Do they feed you, Johnny, before they send you to the breakers? Do they give you more than the one potato to take down on a 12-hour shift? Do they let you see the sun all day long? <laughs> Do they give you one day off all year long? You don't look that old to me, Johnny. How old are you? When will you be 11? When's your birthday? You mind anthracite coal, Mr. Griffiths? Well, they pay you for that. Two dollars and a half a week. It's for a 12-hour day, seven-day week. What vein do you work in? How's the air in there? What do you mean bad? Does it give you headaches? So now tell us, sir, just how the air affects you, your headaches, your eyes, your lungs. You ever go to a doctor? Does the company have doctors for the men, any at all? And, and have you asked to see one? And they wouldn't? Now I'd like to ask you about the time you lost your leg. Did the company offer to buy you a wooden leg? They acknowledged that the accident occurred in the mine, and still they wouldn't. The gentlemen of the commission, the demand for a decent life, for an eight-hour day at a decent wage, is not a demand to shirk work as is claimed in this case. The laborer who asks for shorter hours asks for a breath of life. He asks for a chance to develop the best that is in him. Our country and our civilization is based on the belief that despite all his weaknesses, man still has within him that divine spark that causes him to reach upwards for something higher and better than anything he has ever known. It took the commission over 30 days to hand down its findings. When we first moved to Chicago, I told Jesse I'd rather, I'd rather help the men get the eight hour day than be elected president of the United States. Now 
that we'd won, I had no one to share it with. Jesse and I had been drifting apart for some time. Now Paul and the house were all we had in common. We've just been going down different roads for so long, Jess. We're, we're, we're not in the same place anymore. No, of course it's not your fault. Is there really any sense in thinking things could be different after 18 years? Oh, I don't know. I, I could be making a mistake. I just, I, I, I just feel I must have my freedom. <coughs> Sorry, Jess. Now that I was alone, I found myself working harder than ever on things I cared about. We made a beginning in Pennsylvania, but out west there was open warfare miners and mine owners. A man named Harry Orchard, the lowest possible specimen of man you could ever imagine, had killed the ex-governor of Idaho with a bomb and was then trying to say that Big Bill Haywood, the union man, had put him up to it. The current governor of Idaho, a man named Gooding, sent deputies without warrants into Colorado in the dark of night to kidnap Haywood and run him back to Boise for hanging. The United States Constitution may have guaranteed Haywood a fair trial. Governor Gooding did guarantee his exact words that Haywood would never leave Idaho alive. All of Idaho stood up and cheered. Everyone but the miners. The trial lasted 80 days, 80 days of rage and bitterness. The judge's daughter said it sounded like 80 days in an insane asylum. I know I felt like one of the inmates. I took the side of Big Bill Haywood. He was a big man, the toughest I'd ever met. Totally fearless, honest, incorruptible, Strong as an ox inside and out. A terrible temper and only one eye, just like a pirate. No stranger to violence either. Now, I do not mean to suggest that the working man is always right. I know he's sometimes wrong. I know he's sometimes cruel, sometimes corrupt, often unreasonable and unjust, but to hang Bill Hay, or any man, based on the testimony of Harry Orchard, Harry Orchard, this self-confessed perjurer who robbed miners of their ore, who shot and killed a drunken man in a dark street, who tried to kill the governor of Colorado, a man who by his own admission blew up a railroad station, killing 30 people. This is the man on whose testimony you're asked to hang Bill Haywood. <coughs> Gentlemen of the jury, I sometimes think I'm dreaming in this case. I sometimes wonder whether here in Idaho or anywhere in this country, a man can be placed on trial and lawyers seriously asked to take the life of a human being based on the testimony of Harry Orchard. For God's sake, what sort of community exists up here that sane men should ask it? Need I come here from Chicago to defend the honor of your state? There is no way to give Haywood back the 18 months he spent in the Boise jail. The man is so insane he wants to go out and work for the poor, as Haywood has, then these are the wages he receives today, and which he has received since the time that first foolish man commenced to agitate for the upbuilding of the human race. The 
Your eyes are upon you, twelve men of Idaho, tonight. If you kill Haywood, your act will be applauded by many. In the railroad offices of our great cities, among the spiders of Wall Street, in every bank in the world where men hate Haywood because he fights against the system for which the rich grow rich er and fat er from these you will receive blessings and unstinted praise but if your verdict in this case should be not guilty there will still be those who will reverently bow their heads and thank you 12 men of Idaho for the life and reputation you have saved out on our broad prairies where men toil with their hands, on the wide oceans where men are tossed and buffeted on the waves, in the mills and the factories and deep down under the earth, thousands of men and women and children will kneel tonight and ask their God to guide your hearts. As the case was sent to the jury, a sympathetic reporter leaned over to me. Well, it takes 12, he said. No, I said, it only takes one. I knew that in Boise, our best hope was for a hung jury. At a little before five in the morning, an eavesdropper outside the jury room overheard them take a poll. The jury foreman announced a vote of 11 to 1, which in Boise had to be 11 to 1 for conviction. He told the newspaper they had an extra on the street in 10 minutes. Boise rose up in joy. The women came out to breakfast in their finest jewelry, the men in their sharpest suits and ties. They were all just waiting for that last stubborn juror to listen to reason then the barbecue and picnic could start. Finally, the one juror gave in. Have you reached your verdict? We have your honor. What is your verdict? Not guilty. Not guilty. now that I had done my share of the fighting. It hadn't been easy going up against the powerful forces of society in the courts as I had been doing for so many years. I had fought my way through so many conflicts, I felt the need of rest. Also, in my own life, after years of loneliness, first with Jesse and then without her, I had met someone. Ruby was a newspaper woman, and a good one. She was red-headed and beautiful, and we fell in love. Up till this time, I had believed, along with a lot of others, that getting married was like going into a restaurant with a friend. You order what you want, and then when you see what the other fella got, you wish you'd taken that. <laughs> I've always been a finicky eater. I don't like spinach, and I'm glad I don't. Because if I liked it, I'd eat it, and I just hate it. <laughs> I don't like shredded wheat either, and I don't like anybody who does. Oh, after Jesse and I were married, oops. Didn't mean to say Jesse. After Ruby and I were married, I think I would have been perfectly happy to spend the rest of my life with her in Chicago rather than running around the country looking for new fights to fight. But then in 1911, the Los Angeles Times building blew up. 
killing 20 men, and Samuel Gompers of the American Federation of Labor persuaded me that I would go down in history as a traitor to their great cause if in this hour of their greatest need I refused to take charge of the McNamara defense. I didn't want the case. I, I, I pleaded with him to be excused. As hard as it was to say yes, it would have been even harder to say no. Ruby and I left for Los Angeles. Los Angeles, the city of angels. <laughs> Not every working man in the country is the scabbiest town on earth. The Los Angeles Times and its publisher, Harrison Gray Otis, ran the town. They fought the unions and always won. Always. Otis was a man to contend with. A big, loud man with a walrus mustache, goatee, military bearing. He looked like Buffalo Bill or General Custer. <laughs> he was a holy terror to work for and absolutely despised the unions. No union man ever worked for the Times in any capacity. This is war, said Otis. And he was right. These have been years of hard and bitter fighting. Right up until the early morning hours of October 1st, 1911, when there was an explosion in an alley near the Times plant. The explosion caused a terrible fire in which 20 men were trapped and burned to death. Before the ashes had cooled, before anyone knew what had caused the explosion, Harrison Gray Otis put this in his paper. Oh, you anarchic scum, you cowardly killers. Go look at the ruins wherein are buried the calcined remains of those you have murdered. A man named Horty McManagle had been arrested on a different charge. In order to save himself, he told police that two of his good friends, John Jay and James B. McNamara, brothers and leaders of the Structural Iron Workers Union, had planted the bomb in the alley at the Times. At the time the charge was made, John was in Indiana, James, James was in Illinois. Los Angeles sent men out in the dark of night it was the Haywood case in Idaho all over again, to kidnap the brothers and rush them back for trial. History repeats itself. That's one of the things wrong with history. <laughs> I went to the jail to meet with my clients for the first time. James, 28, was lean, with a bright gleam in his eye and a touch of the poet. John, 27, had a strain of Irish melancholy. He had studied law. I liked them both right from the start. That day, I started, I started assembling a staff and starting the months of preparation necessary for the defense. Every ounce of energy and devotion I had went into this case. I went to links I had never gone to before tracking down every possible piece of evidence, every witness all across the country. When I started, I was sure of only one thing. All labor everywhere across the country was absolutely convinced the McNamara's were innocent. Every union in the country contributed to the defense. Thousands of letters came into our office from working men wanting to make a small contribution to their save, from their savings. But, but the deeper I dug into this case, the more it became unmistakably clear to me the McNamara's had planted the bomb at the time. 
Everything Artie McManigal had said they had done, they had done. And they left a trail a mile wide, and the stake would surely hang them. Why, I asked James, why? First he wouldn't answer me. Finally he said, there was a labor parade. The cops beat up some of the boys. The next morning the Times praised the cops for their heroic work. It was more than I could stand. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't stand the thought of them hanging, but I didn't know how to prevent it. I did not know what to do. And then, despite all the rage and bitterness in Los Angeles, if, if the brothers would confess to everything before the trial, perhaps I could convince the prosecution to let them plead guilty and go to jail. I decided to try. I couldn't tell anyone, not even governors, <coughs> for fear of jeopardizing the negotiations. Then, after weeks of discussions, discussions with the McNamara's, discussions with the prosecution, discussions with Harrison Gray Otis, we were able to conclude an agreement that saved the brothers' lives. Full confessions, Life in prison for James McNamara, 15 years for John. On the day the trial was to start in Los Angeles, tens of thousands of our friends staged a parade. They cheered me all the way to the courthouse. I had to push my way through a crowd of well-wishers to get inside. Here, as in every city in the land, Working men proudly wore their badges. McNamara's not guilty. <coughs> May it please the court, our clients wish to change their plea from not guilty to guilty. crowded courtroom, people would not believe what they had heard. Then some wept. Some got up shaking. Then screamed in anger. All labor, all people who had believed in the McNamara's with all their hearts were now being told they were wrong. They felt betrayed. Many felt I had betrayed them. It took a long time for the great room to empty. I went out with the rest. It was getting dark. It was getting dark. McNamara buttons lay where they had been thrown in the gutter. Billy Cavanaugh, a policeman and still my friend, came over to me. He was alarmed by the people shaking their fists and calling me traitor. And he took my arm. Come with me, he said. I wasn't brave. But I looked him in the face and said, No, Billy. I'll go down the street with the crowd. I walked with them when they cheered me. I'll go back the way I came. trying to suborn, to bribe the McNamara jury. 
An associate of mine had hired a detective, a man named Bert Franklin, to investigate prospective jurors. <coughs> he did more than investigate them. He offered five of them bribes if they could bring in a not guilty verdict in the McNamara trial, or if that wasn't possible, to hang the jury. There's no question about what Franklin did. He was caught red-handed. For weeks, he wouldn't say who he had acted for, if anyone. He did say that I had nothing to do with it and no knowledge of it being done. And then, Matt, and then uh, Franklin was put on trial. He pleaded guilty and was let off with a fine. <laughs> After that was all settled, he told the grand jury that I had given him the money, told him who to bribe, how, and with how much. <clears throat> and so I was indicted. My trial lasted three months, 92 days, longer than Debs, longer than Big Bill Haywood, longer than any man I had ever defended. I don't think I could have gotten through it all without Ruby, who was by my side, in court and out. It was as hard on her as it was on me. I think what made it particularly difficult is that we were alone in a city without many friends, and most of those thought I was guilty. When Judge Hutton called the case of the People versus Clarence Darrow, my lawyer stood up, as I had so many times, and said, Ready, Your Honor. Then he had to tap me on the shoulder and say, You're supposed to stand up too, Clarence. You're the defendant. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I did contribute to my own defense, especially in the cross-examination of Franklin, Gentlemen, I have said about all I care to about Franklin. I have said enough. I have said too much. All I am asking you to do is carefully consider the man's story. Is it reasonable or is it absurd? Dear God, they ought to adjourn this court until Monday morning and try this case with the insanity cases. <coughs> Never mind the... the reputation and tradition of a profession I have followed for almost 40 years. Would I take this sort of chance with these gumshoe men everywhere, their eyes on everyone connected with this case? Detectives over the town thick as lice in Egypt? <laughs> Gentlemen, don't ever think your own life, that liberty is safe, that your own that your own family is secure. Don't ever think that any human being is safe when under evidence like this, I, with some influence in some respect, can be brought here and placed in the shadow of the penitentiary. I know my life. I know what I've done. My life has not been perfect. It has been human, too human. I have tried to be of help in this world. I, I have not had malice in my heart. I have done the best I could. I ask you to save my liberty and my name. The jury was out only 34 minutes before it came in. I thought they wanted instructions from the judge. But the jury foreman stood up and said he had a verdict. And he smiled and he called out, not guilty. Ruby was by <coughs> my side and we hugged and kissed. First person down to us was Judge Hutton, who ran down from the bench <coughs> to embrace me. I shook the hand of every juror and hundreds of others gathered round. It took us over two hours to get out of that court. Oh, I was gladder than you know to get home to Chicago, even though for a long time Chicago wasn't so glad to have me. <laughs> That's the way it is sometimes. The charge hangs on after the acquittal. 
It took some people years to forget what they thought I'd done and trust me with their cases. Some never forgot. Of all the clients I represented before my own trial, none of them ever asked me to represent them again. <laughs> I thought my lawyering days were over. But then a very nice young man named Peter Sisman, who had apprenticed in my old firm in the 90s, asked me to come in as his partner. I, uh, I told him I, I didn't have the heart for it, that I was through with the law. He said I had to, but if I didn't, it would be a tacit admission of guilt. <laughs> I told him I couldn't bring him any business. He said that was all right, too. I worked three months for Peter Sisman before I got my first case, a year before I was pulling my own weight. We were a mainly uh, criminal practice, and I met and defended some unpopular people. Unfortunate souls, murderers alleged or in fact. I never hesitated to defend a man accused of murder, if only to prevent a second murder by the state. These were hard times for unpopular people. Ah, oh, red baiting, palmer raids, witch hunts, newspapers, <coughs> government telling people to mob, jail, and kill dissenters. Like the 16 Chicago communists, guilty of the crime of talk. And the secretary of the Rockford branch of the Communist Labor Party, accused of using the entire resources of the party's treasury, the entire 30 cents, to overthrow the government of the United States. The 11 Italian anarchists in Milwaukee, who may have had the bad taste to call this country a jail and our president a pig, but gentlemen of the jury, those are errors of judgment rather than transgressions against the legal structure. I shall not argue whether their ideas are right or wrong. I do not have to find them right to take their case, and you do not have to find them right in order to find them not guilty. But this jury should find things difficult for a man to be a rebel. You would be doing the worst you could for the downfall of the human race. We lost most of these political cases in court and again on appeal. But every now and again, a judge would agree with us in dissent. If there's only one man to state the case for freedom, maybe that's all it takes. One. In addition to law, I did some uh, did some debating and lecturing on the Chautauqua circuit after we were got back to Chicago. I, uh, it helped with our expenses those first few years, and, and, I, and I, I, after a while I grew to enjoy it as much as anything I did. I always liked taking the anti-side in debate. I liked the feeling of getting to my feet after my opponent had received his ovation, and then, uh, and then I liked, I liked facing an audience of 500 or 1,000 people who were waiting for me to fall on my face. And then I liked trying to turn some of those people to my way of thinking, or at least make them ask themselves a question or two. Should the United States have prohibition? Take away all the men and women who have drunk down through the past, and you would take away all the literature and poetry and all the works of great art the world has produced. <laughs> what kind of a poem do you think you'd get out of a glass of ice water? <laughs> Man have an immortal soul. <laughs> oh, I once debated a man who uh, got carried away and told the audience, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Captain of his soul, hell, he wasn't even deckhand on a raft. 
Is life worth living? <laughs> no. Though I see a fine looking woman on the third row there who makes a good argument for the other side. <laughs> oh, I've often told young men just starting out in business that rather than making acquaintances, they should make friends. Acquaintances are of little value unless you're planning to run for office. And I know that each of you has higher ambition than that. <laughs> As a young man growing up on the farm outside Kinsman, Ohio, I was taught to believe as an article of faith that any little boy growing up anywhere in America could eventually one day hope to be president of this great land and all its people. Now I'm beginning to believe. <laughs> Being a lawyer, however, now that's a different kettle of fish. A high art requiring sophisticated discipline and the most rigid application of scientific knowledge. How to choose a jury, for example. <laughs> if a Presbyterian enters the jury box, and carefully rolls up his umbrella, let him go. <laughs> he is cold as the grave. <laughs> he knows right from wrong, but seldom finds anything right. <laughs> Get rid of him with as few words as possible before he contaminates the others. <laughs> if possible, Baptists are more hopeless than Presbyterians, and the sooner they leave, the better. <laughs> Methodists are worth considering. They are nearer the soil. If chance sets you down between a Methodist and a Baptist, you'll move toward the Methodist to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> As for Unitarians and Universalists, it is best to inspect them with some care as they may be prohibitionists. <laughs> Either Lutherans or Scandinavians are unsafe. But if both in one, leave your client guilty and go down the docket. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I've never been much for organized religion or anything else that tries to tell people what they ought to believe and what will happen to them if they don't. The fear of God or anything else is not the beginning of wisdom. Better to have doubt. Doubt leads to investigation, and that's the beginning of wisdom. Still, I'm a lawyer, and I'm supposed to check these things out for myself. Ruby and I took a vacation to Palestine to see where it all began. We met an Arab boatman there who offered to row us out to the spot where Jesus walked on the water. For this, all he wanted was $15. <laughs> no wonder Jesus walked. <laughs> Lest we forget, the most religious people, the most righteous believers of all, are of course the fundamentalists, who believe that every word of the Bible is absolutely true, and don't want the schools or anyone else teaching anything different. Noah got two of every animal species on the ark, including about a million insects. <laughs> Joshua made the sun stand still so the day could be extended and he could finish the battle. Balaam's ass spoke to him, probably in Hebrew. <laughs> Many asses have spoken, doubtless some in Hebrew, but they have not been that breed of ass. William Jennings Bryant. Welcome to Tennessee, sir. You have given considerable study to the Bible, haven't you, Mr. Bryant? You have written and published articles on the Bible almost weekly for the past 50 years. You believe that everything in the Bible should be interpreted literally? So when you read that the whale swallowed Jonah, you accept that literally?
Was it, uh, was it your ordinary run-of-the-mill whale or one made especially for that purpose? <laughs> ah, of course, it was a miracle. You believe Joshua made the sun stand still? Uh -huh. So then you must also believe that at that time the sun went around the earth. No? Oh, then it must have been the earth he made stand still. <laughs> Do you ever ponder what would, uh, what would naturally happen to the earth if it suddenly stood still? Don't you know that it would have been turned into a molten mass of matter? Don't you care? You believe the story of the flood? When was the flood? Let's see. The flood was around 2348 BC. That's according to Bishop Usher's calculations. And you accept them? All right. So you believe that everything on the earth that was living on the earth, but not contained in the ark, was destroyed. So that 4,273 years ago, taking the 1,925 years <coughs> going back to the Bible and adding that to the 2,348 years going back to the flood, so that 4,273 years ago, every living thing on the earth, the only living things on the earth, were the people in the ark, the animals in the ark, and the fishes. <laughs> Any idea who Noah threw the rope to when he docked the ark? <laughs> <laughs> you believe Eve was the first woman? Do you believe she was literally made from Adam's rib? Do you ever discover where Cain got his wife? The Bible says he got one, doesn't it? Uh, were there any other people on the earth at that time? There were no other people, but Cain got a wife. When the Bible says the morning and the evening were the same day, does that mean anything to you? Were those 24-hour days? No? Any idea how long they were? Uh-huh. So, uh... You don't have no idea how long the days were, but do you, do you believe that the sun was made on the fourth day? Uh -huh. All right. Then how could we distinguish the evening from the morning of the first three days without any sun? <laughs> the Bible does. Your Bible does. Doesn't that bother you? Oh, you say my uh, argument's going in one ear and out the other. I'm not surprised. There's nothing in between to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Today, if you can take a thing like evolution and make it a crime to teach it in the public schools, then tomorrow you can make it a crime to teach it in the church. And in the next session, you may ban books and newspapers. You can do the one, you can do the other. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, as I got older and closer to my final exams, <laughs> I'd get religion, even after the monkey trial. I never did. I still believe that after I die, there'll be nothing left over, neither heaven nor hell. Ruby has a slightly different point of view. She believes there is a heaven and a hell, but that it won't make any difference which one I go to. I'll have so many good friends in both places. <laughs> <laughs> I have found that nobody wants another life. We just want to keep on living, which is quite a different matter. Maybe someday we'll even be willing to let the other fellow live. A committee came to me from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, asking me to defend 11 Negroes in Detroit on a charge of murder. 
I told him I was tired after 48 years in the law and not mentally or physically fit. But I knew I would go even as I made these excuses. I knew as soon as they told me about Dr. Ossian's sweep. In the early days, Detroit, along with other northern cities, were friendly to the Negroes, but that was a long time ago. Now, well, you all know about the Chicago riots that all began when a colored boy on a raft washed to a white bathing beach, and men of my race stoned him to death. 120 people killed in those riots. St. Louis, Washington, Detroit, I'm not blaming Detroit, I'm saying what happened there. <coughs> Dr. Sweet bought a house, a nice house, at the corner of Charler Boy and Garland Streets in an all-white section. When the neighborhood found out he was a Negro, they banded together in a neighborhood improvement association and made threats. Dr. Sweet asked the police for protection, which they provided. then uh, offered uh, solace for anyone else who wanted to come into the house. He also, he, he, uh, the police took his wife and his goods and put them in the house. He also took his two brothers and some friends with him, and he also took some rifles and a police full of cartridges. Dr. Sweet was a man of strong character. A white man does pretty well when he does what Dr. Sweet did. Someone who can start with nothing, work his way through college, study medicine, do postgraduate work in Europe, earning every penny as he goes along, shoveling snow and coal, is some fellow. But Dr. Sweet had the handicap of the color of his face. <coughs> There is no handicap more terrible than that. So Dr. Sweet moved into his new house. The first night, a crowd gathered. They made some noise, but that was about all. Inside the house, nobody went to bed. They kept the lights turned out and looked out the windows all night. The second night, the crowd grew bigger and more boisterous. Eight or ten policemen were stationed around the place, but they were mainly ornamental. At 11 o'clock, with men in the house standing at the windows with guns, Dr. Sweet's brother drove up. The mob attacked him as he made his way to the house, then rushed the house, throwing rocks as they came. Shots were fired from in the house into the street, where a white man, Leo Briner, was killed. All 11 people in the house, Dr. Sweet, his wife, his two brothers, and seven friends, were arrested on the spot and, in, and charged with murder in the first degree. As you would imagine, the feeling in Detroit ran strongly against them. There are not many colored people in America charged with killing white people who have lived to tell the tale. I went to the Detroit jail to meet with Dr. Sweet. He was a young man, quiet, serious, attractive. He told me about that night, about the mob yelling, get them, get the niggers, and the people rushing the house like a human sea is how he described it, and the rocks hailing against the house. When I opened the door to let my brother in and saw that mob, he said, I knew it was the same mob that had hounded my people throughout its history. I knew what mobs had done to my people before. The legal problem was to show that the people outside the house constituted a mob that endangered the Sweets' lives. But the real problem was to show that this was not a case of murder, <coughs> but instead a case of race prejudice. That meant the case could be won or lost on choosing a jury. J. 
Gentlemen, if we are to choose a jury wisely in this case, I need to know what you really think about the Negro. Do you consider him as an equal, as a fellow American? Do you like him? Do you believe you could give him as fair and square a deal as you would a white man? All right. Gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution says that this is not a race question. The race and color have nothing to do with this case. This is a case of murder. I insist that there is nothing but prejudice in this case. That if things were reversed and there were 11 white men defending their home and lives from a mob of blacks, no one would have even dreamed of having them indicted. I know what I'm talking about, and so do you. They would have been given medals instead. Ten black men and a woman are in this indictment, gentlemen, being tried by 12 jurors. All of you are white, aren't you? There's not a single colored man on this jury. We couldn't get one. One was called and he was disqualified. You 12 white men are trying a black man on race prejudice. Now don't bother trying to tell me you are not prejudiced. I know better. We're all nothing but a bundle of prejudices anyhow. We are prejudiced against other people's color, prejudiced against other men's religions, prejudiced against other people's politics, Prejudice against the way other people look. Prejudice against the way other people dress. <coughs> we are full of prejudices. My only hope, gentlemen of the jury, is this, that you are strong enough and honest enough and decent enough to lay it aside in this case and try it as you ought to. What, what do you think is your duty in this case? Day after day, I have watched these black, tense faces that are now looking to you, 12 whites, feeling that the hopes and fears of a race are in your keeping. Their eyes are fixed on you. Their, their, their hearts go out to you. Their hopes hang on your burden. The jury deliberated over 40 hours before finally reporting they could not agree. The judge had to declare a mistrial. We tried the case a second time. This time we won. change without trouble, in some cases without disaster. There have been times lately when I wished I was either younger or older. If I was younger, I'd go to the South Seas. If I was older, I wouldn't care so much. I would feel better about my work if I knew there had been any advance in law since I was admitted to the bar 50 years ago. In science and mathematics, the world has been made over new. Even in religion, there is an entirely modified and broader attitude. The entire material world has been made over, but the law and its administration has stood frozen and adamant, defying time and eternity and all the advances of our day and age. You wonder what the compensations are? For me, there has been one that has made it all worthwhile. 102 men I have defended have faced the death penalty, and none has been hanged. And none ever will be, because I would never dare take another chance. <laughs> I 
unless, unless, unless I knew there was no other way, why did they kill? Not for money, not for spite, not for hate. They kill little Bobby Franks as they might kill a spider or a fly for the experience. They killed him because they were made that way. Because somewhere in the infinite processes that go to the making up of the boy or the man, something slipped. And these two young men sit here today, hated and despised, with the community screaming for their blood. Your Honor, the easy thing for you to do, and the popular thing for you to do, would be to hang Dicky Loeb and Babe Leopold. Men and women who do not think will applaud. The thoughtless will approve. I am pleading for a time when hatred and cruelty will not control the hearts of men. When we can learn by reason and judgment and understanding that all lives are worth saving. And that mercy is the highest attribute of man. If I should succeed in saving these boys' lives, my greatest reward and my greatest hope will be that I have done something to help human understanding, to temper justice with mercy, to overcome hate with love. I was reading last night of the aspiration of the old Persian poet Omar Khayyam. It appealed to me as the highest aspiration I could envision. I wish it was in my heart, and I wish it was in the hearts of all. So I be written in the book of love. I do not care about that book above. Erase my name, or write it as you will. So I be written in the book of love.